All right, and welcome to another episode of Empire. I am Peter Barenberg, along as always with my buddy, founder and CEO of Purewell. Nick, how you doing, buddy? Uh, well, <laughs> I'm trying to stay dry right now, Pete. I mean, as everybody knows, we're dealing with a little bit of a hurricane right now. Um, eh, a little wet down here, a little wet. <laughs> it's a little wet. It's a little wet. So obviously we hope that all the families are safe and uh, everybody we know and safe and secure and, uh, you know, get their electricity back and uh, absolutely everything that they need it. Thank God, you know, hopefully no one got hurt or, or anything like that or, or damage. So, um, so our hearts are and thoughts and prayers are out for the people that are dealing with the hurricane right now. So, um, but, uh, so pretty much in North Florida, not a, down here in sunny South Florida, we kind of skirted it once again. We, we did. We did. We kind of – basically, if anyone knows where our headquarters is in Delray Beach, um, Boynton Beach area, that type of – so it's South Florida on the east side. And basically this went up the coast on the west coast and then kind of cut through the, the state through Orlando. So it missed us. So we're lucky, right? That we are. That we are. And, uh, well, I guess we should get right to our guest here. We're talking about someone who's actually got one of his songs on an iconic movie for an iconic director. And we're talking about The Wolf of Wall Street and Martin Scorsese. And the song is Meth Lab Zozo Sticker by Seven Horse. We're talking with the drummer, Phil Levitt. Phil, how are you doing, sir? I'm well, Pete. How are you? Uh, hey, Nick. I'm, uh, I'm doing well out here in sunny California. No hurricanes, of course. Uh, and today the earth is not shaking, so we're happy. Uh, <laughs> but I'm uh, feeling for you guys in Florida. I've been I've been uh, staying uh, tuned to the coverage, and uh, I've got some friends there. So uh, just uh, hope you guys. Uh, I'm happy to hear you guys uh, got spared this time. The, yeah, the, I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, Phil. And um, you know, it's it's funny because you know we're talking about this very iconic song. This song is still holds strong even in 2022. Um, the song just got used in Kevin James's Netflix football comedy Home Team, which was which was pretty cool. Um, what do you think about the song? Is it that you know makes it so iconic or and works so well in a movie? Yeah, you know, it's really it's really funny because when when that thing happened last year with Kevin James and the and the uh, uh, home team, I mean, that's a kids movie. That's a G rated. Still funny. Right, right, funny. Right, right. But I mean, if you think about the difference between the Wolf of Wall Street, what was going on in that film and how they used how Scorsese used this track and what's going on in Kevin James. I mean, but we've been told that any, <laughs> anything basically in slow motion. This song works if you see people walking in slow motion. And I think it starts, if I may be so uh, humble as to talk about this, it's that opening drum groove. I mean, when you have boom, cha, for sure, oh, yeah. boom, it just puts you immediately in this mood of like, oh, this has swagger. And that's really what this thing is all about is the swagger. I think we probably worked against ourselves a little bit with the title Meth Lab Zoso sticker. That may have a tendency <laughs> to put some people off, but that was my partner's, you know, the, the, the funny backstory on this song is, you know, we go back, uh, my partner and I, Joey Calio, go back a long way from another band called Dada in the 90s. And we started this project, Seven Horse, in uh, 2010. And the first track we ever cut was this song, Meth Lab Soso Sticker. And how it started was he sent me the opening guitar riff, which is, you know, ba -da 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 -da, this country blues kind of goofy hillbilly riff. He sent that to me. And it had a title on it that said Meth Lab Zoso Sticker. And for him, that was just a way to document this riff in his phone. He didn't really mean that as a title. He was watching Breaking Bad. He loves Led Zeppelin. <laughs> How funny. He saw the connection between Led Zeppelin and, and, and Breaking Bad, and he just labeled it Meth Lab Zoso Sticker. I get this thing in my phone. I see that, and I go, well, that's a pretty cool title. I've never seen that before. I'm going to write the whole lyric around this title. And he was kind of like, are you sure you want to go there with that? I was like, yeah, I think this is going to be good. And, uh, you know, little did we know that this thing would end up in the Wolf of Wall Street with the incredible iconic director, Martin Scorsese, which is, a you know, an incredible honor to have it in his movie. And then just last year in this G-rated family friendly Kevin James thing on Netflix, we were kind of blown away that how could this song exist in both of these worlds simultaneously, but yet it does. And, it, and that's not the only place it's been used. That song's been used a few different times in a few different projects. And it always seems to work when people are looking for that swagger and that, that feeling of like, this is a badass moment in this piece. So, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty pleased with that. 
I listen, I definitely feel like that. I mean, I think everybody does when they hear it. So I can't, I think you nailed it just exactly the way it is. It's funny because Kevin James, I don't know if he still does, but he had bought a house, I maybe five minutes from us, right on the, right on the corner, right on. Yeah. Right on, yeah. right on the corner. Um, right on the water down the street. I, again, I don't know if he still has it. So it's kind of funny, but I've been still wa- if it's walking the street. We'll hear that song playing. So we'll know. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Well, or maybe his a uh, segue from mall cops that he just, <laughs> and he has it playing on a segue. <laughs> um, so is now, is it true that you got the name of your band from your, your grandfather? Cause he was a better. Yeah. My grandfather, that, that, you know, true? my grand. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's that's uh, that's kind of the story. Uh, my grandfather, my my family's from Chicago. My grandfather, uh, in the uh, '30s and '40s, was uh, into uh, you know he worked in illegal gambling in Chicago. He also worked for Capone uh, as a collector. Uh, that was oh, wow. the beginning of his career. But he was involved in casinos from a very young age, and eventually came to Las Vegas, which is where I was born. But he loved to play the horses. I mean, he he was an everyday kind of horse better. Uh, and uh, certainly in Las Vegas, in the sports book, he would hit the sports book before going on a shift at the old Stardust Hotel. And he would lay a, a $20 bet to win. That was his bet. He always bet to win and he always bet 20. Uh, and the seven horse was one of his you know favorite bets. He had a couple of other bets, you know, always bet a, a, a gray horse on turf and certain jockeys. I mean, he was deep, 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 <laughs> deep, deep, deep into it. Um, but uh, 20 to 20 on the seven horse to win was one of his bets. And so when we were trying to come up with a name for a band, which is one of the toughest things you ever want to do is uh, try to find a name for your band. Um, we just thought seven horse and we put it together, the seven and the horse. And it's kind of a tribute to my grandfather. And, and it just sort of worked, you know, being from Las Vegas and the kind of uh, subject matter we were dealing with this kind of like bar room, uh, you know, kind of vibe that we have, uh, particularly at the beginning. It just seemed to fit for us. Yeah, no, I, it's, 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 a great, it's, good. it's a great name. That's why I thought it was kind of cool that you, I mean, look, my grandfather is important to me. I know I'm sure for Pete, love the ties at Capone. I mean, that's, we're, yeah. we're both Italian, so right. that's always a good thing. So, um, but, but the point is, is that, uh, you know, it, it's just nice that uh, you always hear the, the story of, of where it comes yeah, from. Yeah, and it's cool. a nice you know, I, I get to think about we're actually him. Guess. You know, you get to think about him. Every time the band name comes up, he pops into my head, and that's just a great way to always remember him. Yeah, for sure. What would you say, Pete? No, I was saying. No, I was saying a nice little tie into Capone is that uh, my grandparents were guests of Capone's over at uh, I think the Green Doors is a place in Chicago, right? right? Or the Green? Yeah, yeah. yeah, they went there as guests of his because you know my family, you know, in the city they they were known here and there a little bit. There you go. Oh, there you go. There you go. The um, what's your other name, Pete? What, what's the uh, what's the family name? No. Um, so um, two, that's uh, no names. <laughs> Um, well, in 2014, you released an album titled Songs for a Voodoo Wedding, and one of the songs in the album was called A Friend in Weed. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, we love that here in Empire. Um, yeah. So, obviously, well, you know, it's, fan- not the, it, it's not the weed you're thinking of, of course. This oh. was a song. This was a song we wrote. Uh, we were going to a music festival in Weed, California. All okay. right. There's a little town near the border of California and Oregon called Weed. Uh, and it's named after a lumber magnate named Abner Weed. Uh, and, uh, oh, wow. you know, so it's the town's named after him. But, of course, in Weed, they make the most out of it. If you roll into the gas station in Weed, every refrigerator magnet, bumper <laughs> sticker, they all have a green leaf on them. I mean, you got to make money somehow in Weed. So we, right. came, we came to Weed to play this music festival, and the people there were so kind to us, and we were really friendly, and we had a great time there, that we decided to write this tune called A Friend in Weed. But, of course, there's a double entendre there, and, and the song does have a lot of – uh, marijuana references in it. Well, that's what I was going to say. You must be a big fan of cannabis. I mean, this is. I am a. I am a. I am an enthusiast. Yes, I am an enthusiast, and it goes back, you know, generations. Really, my uh, little did I know, growing up in Las Vegas uh, in the seventies, uh, uh, that uh, both my father and my mother were enthusiasts in the back in the days when it was highly illegal. I remember, uh, you know, my dad used to work graveyard, uh, which is like eight p.m. till till. Uh, I don't know, four in the morning. Um, 
or, or maybe midnight to, to eight. He was a blackjack dealer uh, at the Stardust, at the Mint, and eventually at Caesar's Palace. And I would see him getting ready for work. And I remember one day I, I was, he was getting dressed and uh, I was like, what is that? What is that smell? <laughs> you know, that's probably like nine or 10. And he goes, oh, Turkish cigarettes. Um, but we had a hookup okay. in the house. Yeah. Never I, I heard never, that one, Turkish cigarettes. Yeah, right. That's a good so, one, though. My dad was a lifelong, a lifelong pot smoker. Uh, my mom, too, she's still around. My dad's no longer with us, but my mom is still alive and in, uh, in her 70s and is still an enthusiast. And, uh, you know, my dad and I, uh, we, we, uh, imbibed together. I used to take him to the pharmacy here in, uh, Los Angeles to, uh, pick up his supplies. I mean, it was something that we actually bonded over as father and son, if you can believe it. So now how old or, you know, when, when were you introduced, I guess, I mean, I don't know, obviously it's in your family, but when did you yeah. partake or, you know, when was the you know it's really, it's, it's interesting because when, you know, all through the high school years, when most people are really getting into it, I was, because I think it was in my house so much. And uh, my dad did have a lot of issues in his life uh, because of other drugs. I think harder drugs, he was, okay. you know, unable to stay away from, he, he was a kind of a guy who was an excessive sort of personality. Whatever you had, you have to have more of it. Whatever, there is no limit that, that, you know, just go as far as you possibly can. And he did. In La, and in Las Vegas in those days, uh, as is now, I mean, everything was available. And it's very hard to stay away from uh, the nightlife, especially after you're working. All very hard shift. to say no. Yeah, right? Very hard to say no there to a lot of things. But but I had a different when my parents split up, I sort of took a different approach. And I was very anti throughout my high school years. But I, I got a gig when I was uh, 20 years old. I got a road gig that started in Alaska. I was in Alaska on Kodiak Island for two months playing. Uh, actually, it was the other way around. The gig started in Kauai, Hawaii. It was a, it was a top 40 bar gig in a uh, Chinese restaurant slash nightclub in, uh, on the island of Kauai called Club Jetty. And we were staying at the home of the owner, which was like this rundown kind of Hawaii plantation house. And and it was really cool. No screens on the windows, bugs all over the place. You're sleeping on a mattress on the floor. But we loved it. We were in Hawaii for two months uh, playing, yeah, of uh, pl playing music. Of Hawaii. What's their... It was amazing. I, I uh, and the other, <laughs> the other thing that this guy did was he grew and distributed uh, marijuana. Okay. And so uh, he introduced me. Uh, there on Hawaii, which is a pretty good place to get into it. Uh, Kauai Electric was the first uh, strain that I ever smoked. And, uh, you know, I was- Maui Wowie is another good one. Yeah, Maui <laughs> Wowie is another good one. I still enjoy that. I don't see Kauai Electric out here too much, but in the, right, yeah, no, in there no. on the island you did. And, I, you know, I was just like most people that the first hit, I was like, I don't feel anything. And then five minutes later, you know, you're laughing your head off and having the greatest time <laughs> you've ever had in your life. That was exactly the experience that I had. And I never looked back from that. I really didn't. And that was a long time ago. Now, do you say, you know, again, obviously you're using it recreational and having it fun and, and all that stuff, but do you feel like it helped you in any way or did it have any medical benefits to you or in music or in life? Or, well, I mean, I'll tell you, I mean, you know, look, create creatively, I've always used it as a way to open my mind up and, and to break down barriers to that, whatever that, uh, that creative force is that is out there. If you know, that, that tends to come in when you have eliminated all of your own personal barriers to allowing it to come in. Cause that's what songwriting is all about. Really. It's allowing things to come in. It's not that you think of the thing it's that the things are out there and they somehow penetrate you and you latch onto it. And that's how you go. You're just waiting for, I mean, I guess that's inspiration for me. Yeah. Uh, cannabis has always been the gateway to inspiration. It's that way for a lot of musicians. It doesn't always work when you're actually trying to make the records, you know, things <laughs> as a drummer, your, right. your time can get a little out of hand and you don't, you can mm. get lo a little bit lost. I certainly, <laughs> certainly, you know, cutting vocals, it's a little bit different, but the, for for songwriting trouble with speeds yeah right, right. For, you know you just lose track of the actual time you know the, the essence of time starts to get distorted and that's not the greatest thing for a drummer but in the process <laughs> of, in the creative process man i've never found anything like it to be honest with you it's like a, it's just like a magic key that unlocks a lot of 
uh, those avenues that you're looking for to, to uh, connect with that universal energy. I mean, that's what it's here for, I believe. That's my take. No, I, no, Very I true. Absolutely agree. And, and that's why I was wondering your, your take on it, because, yeah. you know, you saying, and I, I think it's, it's fair to say, again, parents that offer their children alcohol. Now, now, now I know that this is going to sound weird, but what I mean is, is in it coming from an Italian family, my dad would have a glass of wine and go, Hey, do you want to, do you want to try a sip? I'm not right. saying like take a bottle, but take a sip. You tried the sip. It was no longer forbidden fruit. It was like, there's alcohol, it's on the table, not a big deal. A lot of friends that I had never had that experience, or, or I guess the parents didn't want to do that. And they go, oh, you know, we're going to go sneak in and, and have a drink. I think this is really kind of the same way with you and cannabis. It was always around. You yeah. kind of were okay with it. It wasn't forbidden. Other people might have been talking about it. And you're like, eh, maybe it's just now for me at this time. And, and so there, I think there is something to be said about that. I'm not saying give your child a bottle of <laughs> vodka, but I think that, you know, that can't hurt. But talk, <laughs> right. But, but talking, uh, talking about it or it being around and then av- actually using that as a bonding. Cause a lot of people, you know, instead of sharing a drink now, share a joint. Yeah, share a blunt, share I mean, that's a bowl, a, it's absolutely, absolutely true for me and, and my parents. And, you know, my dad and I had a rocky road when my folks split up. You know, he, he and I uh, were not together for a while. We had there was a lot of uh, uh, resentment and things we had to get over. Uh, but this was a way for us to uh, kind of find some common ground in those later years in his life when I would take him to uh, to the uh, pharmacy and we pick up some supplies. He'd always like, here's something for you. Uh, and we've had we had some pretty deep conversations around his kitchen table. Yeah. And, and again, I, I think, like you said, it or what we were saying is the bonding experience, you know, instead of yeah. more and more people doing that. And and look, anything that you can do to connect uh, with an elderly or, a, or or a child, you know, a father and their son or a daughter, and mother, or vice versa, whatever. Or um, just your neighbors anyway. Or your neighbors or your best friends or whatever. So it's just it's just a nice thing. And and sometimes it does invoke thought and conversations that I don't know if alcohol what, though, does. I, yeah, I don't know. You know, and there's so many down. I mean, look, I, I like a drink as much as the next guy. But, um, there are, you know, it is a substance that's basically a poisonous substance that does do a lot of people a lot of damage. Whereas I've never heard any. I mean, you know, they keep trying. To, to tell us that there's all kinds of dangers in cannabis, but I, I don't know. I mean, for me, I, I <laughs> right. just haven't experienced any of that. Um, but uh, but no, it leads not, to, I, I, it's I, a I, gateway I, to, to, what do we say all the time? It's a gateway to, to, to happiness. <laughs> and munchies. I mean, I'm kind of and that, I, I, will, I will say this. I'm kind of glad that when I was a teenager, where most of my friends were getting into it, I was not. I'm kind of glad that I got into it a little bit later in life when I was a little bit more developed and I could deal, I could handle it and be in control of myself a little bit. But I think that helped me in a certain way, just get a perspective on, on the whole thing that maybe I wouldn't have had, you know, at 14 or 15, Um, you know, I was, I completely agree. And uh, you know, as an adult, I mean, I think it's important, you know, for me, like I I use it in a, in a, in a a very uh, methodical and thought out way. I'm not, I, I don't overuse anything that I do now. I mean, I, I you know, I like to party, but um, I don't like to be completely out of control. You know, I, I don't, I can't really afford that in my life. So I, I have a better grip on it. I think as an adult than I would have as a kid. We got to get Phil. We definitely got to get Phil some products only because I think you'll like yeah. what we've got. We kind of have that middle of the road type of thing. I mean, we just came out with a new gummy for, you know, any anxiety and things like that, that are, you know, much more CBD and and another cannabinoid focus, CBC and CBG and CBV and a couple other things. But, um, well, I mean, that's cool, but I am a high THC guy. My, the things that I smoke are high THC products because I have, I guess I have some tolerance built up. So I do like to, uh, you know, to, for me to get that mind expansion, I need a good, dose of thc and uh, to really get opened up to that but uh I well mean, mixing that together are... meaning yeah. like you take uh you'll take a gummy you can still smoke you'd be surprised how the cannabinoids interact and give you a much different high 
Um, what it happens with that, and they don't do that in a lot of dispensaries where they really are putting that high dose of CBD, but the fact that you could use them in combination, you'd be surprised the feeling that you would get. A lot of people right. do yeah. coffee and cannabinoids and they do, you know, stimulants right. and cannabinoids, but, and, 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 and high THC is good. There's, there's fine, you know, on some things, but you'd be surprised. Plus your tolerance for all these other cannabinoids are very low. Right, so right. when you try something like that, along with the smoking, it's going to give you a much different feeling and you might Please use it in different me. ways. I'm happy. Yeah. I'm happy yeah. to be educated by you guys. Absolutely. It's like well, making I mean, a little cocktail. Yeah. It's kind of like making a cocktail. Well, look, you know, our side is the hemp side. Um, of course, I'm a big fan of cannabis. We have farms and, uh, you know, but yeah, it's all about the cannabinoids and basically how they interact I mean, there's what's called right. full spectrum, of course, which you have the full entourage effect, which is all the cannabinoids. Then you have isolated cannabinoids when you're talking about CBD or CBG or CBN. And these are the ones that people know about. Again, there's 167 of them or more at this point. Right. So I won't go through all of them, but these are the majors. And then you have THC. THC has a lot of benefits, but there's so many other benefits in like one to one ratios or three to one ratios or 10 to one. And it's, it's, it's dispensaries and, and people aren't educated on how the other cannabinoids are really the ones that are helping you on a medical level. If we're talking about right. medical things or, or, or a neuroprotectant or things into that right. respect. And then and you have the you terpene know, profile on top of that. Right. And, right. The, and the then you have a terpene profile, profile, right? Is that, am, am I right? About not that? not necessarily. The no? Yeah. Oh, okay. It, okay. That is true. But it's also, there's another part of that. That terpene actually gives you the effects when you hear of a sativa or an indigo. Those, that wording is kind of starting to get outdated. They did it because they wanted people to classify into different things. But if you want to get super technical, it's all L sativa. It's just that terpene pro profiles give you different feelings of each strain that you smoke. So it's not just about the taste, but it's actually the effects that it does. But you have to understand marijuana is grown to get you high yeah. in different, in, in different feelings of that, of a high. Hemp is completely different. It's got all the other medicinal fact, uh, factors that'll help you with GI issues, maybe autism, maybe, uh, you know, epilepsy, maybe, you know, ADHD, maybe just in, in, any inflammatory effects, and which are much stronger on the hemp side. So right. when you're talking about terpene profiles, it's not, it's more like, is that a high terp or those terps have to do with giving you more of an indica type feeling? Or a sativa feeling? Is it more focused? Like we have a product that is all, you know, we get everything from hemp, but is super focused. We have a lot of uh, professional athletes that use it. When you go outside, a lot of, believe it or not, musicians that they want to be focused, still feel good, but they want that timing. Exactly what you just yeah. described of not being able to have that with high THC, where you can have that with another type of product, but still have a body high. Wow, that's fascinating. So, um, so you know, my, yeah. my partner, my partner is heavily into the CBD stuff. I mean, he uses um, uh, edibles uh, at night to relax and go to sleep. And I mean, he's well, he needs pure sleep. Really, <laughs> uh, I was going to say he needs that award winning. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's really into it. He's really into it. Yeah, we, we actually created a, a award winning product called Pure Sleep and it's it's got 11 different things in it along with cannabinoids. It's made specifically for sleep, but putting you into REM. So, and that's what we do. We basically take these other products and we mix them with, you know, a molecule that will help in different ways, which is completely different than what we're doing in anything else. So, uh, or, or anybody else is doing it. They're either just doing hemp, CBD, or they're doing uh, cannabinoids. So, um, so again, so, so obviously you talked a little bit about Joey um, and, yep. you know, uh, form, you know, also fellow uh, seven horse member, but um yep. And you were in that band Dada. So we were talking about That's that. Correct. And, yeah. um, but you, but you opened for some pretty big acts. I mean, you had Sting, uh, Kenny Wayne Shepherd. Um, talk to us about some of the people you've gotten to open up for or, or you've got to rub shoulders with, um, and share any stories or blunts with or, or anything in your, your time out in your career. Well, I 
I'll tell you, I mean, the first the first big tour that we did uh, in Dada in 1993, we, we, we had a record that came, our, our debut album came out in 1993. It had a song called I'm Going to Disneyland on it, which was a, nice. a pretty substantial hit. Um, our record company president was Miles Copeland at IRS Records. He was also Sting's manager. Boom, we're out on a world tour with Sting playing uh, big theaters like, you know, 6,000 to 25,000 seaters. Uh, it was an incredible yeah, wow. experience for a young band just getting started, coming out of uh, 300 cap nightclubs to then suddenly be on stage in front of 25,000 people. It's uh, you know, you, you get uh, you grow up in a hurry in that situation. Watching him. I mean, you know, there's a lot of controversial things about Sting. People think he's uh, super cool. Some people think he's a stuck up, uh, you know, prick, whatever. <laughs> he was nothing but cool to us. Uh, I'll never forget the first day we met. It was at the Berkeley uh, Greek Theater, Berkeley, California, an outdoor venue. That was our first show with him. Probably, uh, I don't know, between five and 10,000 seats. Uh, they had backstage tents set up for uh, our dressing room is essentially a tent. Uh, we were in there getting ready. We're all nervous. We're this young band just getting started. We're kind of giddy. We're about to go on in front of his audience. And all of a sudden the curtain opens and there he is. We had not met him before. He's, you know, this was in the heavy yoga tantra days that remember when Sting was talking about how long of course sex and all that. But he was doing <laughs> yoga on tour every day, and he en he entered our tent wearing nothing but the smallest tidy whities you could imagine. So basically, <laughs> he comes in, hello guys, and we're all like, you know, but he was super cool to us. Out there uh, looking like Steve-O. Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah, there he is. There's Sting. He looked incredible. <laughs> um, and uh you know we we went out there and uh, kicked ass on that tour night night nightly and uh, won a, a lot of fans over uh, and it was a great experience to watch him at, at the level he was at the level of professionals and it really taught me a lesson about what it takes to do this on a daily basis you know you don't really understand what it takes to put on these kind of shows until you're backstage watching somebody go through, go about their business it's, almost, it's like watching professional athletes you yeah. know from behind the lines when you see what they go through to get ready when you see the kind of preparation and the work ethic that it takes for the entire organization to put this kind of a show on it's a great lesson for a young band if you're willing to learn it um i ran into uh one time in a recording studio, they're talking about other people and yeah. sharing uh, yeah. experiences with them. In a recording studio in the early uh, 2000s uh, in San Francisco working on a mix. And I looked down in the other room and there's Neil Young sitting there. He's <clears throat> he's recording with Crazy Horse. So oh, wow. I, I was like, wow, that's amazing. And he comes out at one point and I was holding at the time because we were just in the studio mixing. So during that time, I, I do like to get high and just listen. The engineer's working. And so I just thought, well, what the hell? And I just like, hey, Neil, you want to smoke a joint? And uh, he was like, yeah. <laughs> so, See, community. You know, with, him, with him and Crazy Horse. And uh, I basically ended his session because he got high. And at that point, he was like, I'm out of here. Got into his convertible Cadillac and drove away. But he was <laughs> me as well. Um, I was on a session in L.A. in the late 90s. Uh, a friend of mine was uh, uh, an engineer that we had worked with in the Dada days. Uh, he, he called one day and said, listen, uh, we're doing a session at the, the Village, which is a, a venerable L.A. recording studio that like Fleetwood Mac made rumors in and all, all kinds of great records. Steely Dan was made a lot of records there. Um, we ended up making a record there after this experience. But he said, listen, uh, I'm working with Ringo Starr. Uh, come on down. We're doing a group vocal on a Ringo song. And uh, you guys can be on this. And so, uh, you know, I was a gigantic, and still am. I love the Beatles. And really, Ringo oh, yeah. was the reason I'm the a Beatles. drummer. Yeah. Well, I mean, some people, and especially back then, I mean, there was kind of a big yeah. backlash going on. I mean, right, right, right. it's kind of like Michael Jackson, Elvis, yeah. Beatles. I don't know. I mean, they're, they're pretty high. They're pretty high out there. <laughs> the, Beatles, the Beatles for me were, were everything when I was a kid, and, I, and it really was like the refuge. Their music was a refuge for me from the chaos in my house. So I'd put on headphones and play along to, you know, come together or whatever. That's kind of how I learned how to play songs is from Ringo. So anyway, it's a Ringo record. He's doing this record and he's and they're going to have like 30 people in the studio to do this kind of like 
Hey Jude-esque chorus where everybody's singing. It's a song called La Di Da from his uh, record, uh, Vertical Man. So we go down there and, and uh, it was all three of the guys in uh, Dada were on this session. And so we were warned though, coming in like, look, uh, no cameras, okay? Do not be, the, that's the one thing you cannot bring a cam. We're like, all right, we won't bring a cam. So we go down there. Um, we, we had all just, I'd recently dyed my hair when I had it. It was flaming <laughs> red orange, right? Oh, wow. We have the other guy <laughs> in the band was blonde and Joey has very dark hair. So we had this, like, we were really looking like a band when we showed up. Now on this <laughs> session was, uh, the late Scott Weiland was there. Um, uh, uh, Nils Lofgren was on it. Um, uh, it was a cavalcade of stars. Van Dyke Parks, who worked with the Beach Boys, wrote lyrics for Brian Wilson. He was on it. And then also a bunch of friends of Ringo, his lawyer, his doctor, his neighbor, I don't know, a bunch of people. But there's 30 of us there. The producer is a guy named Mark Hudson, who worked with Aerosmith and Ozzy Osbourne and uh, used to be, if anybody goes back to the 70s. These are all legends. Program. The These are all legends. Brothers. Yeah, it was a room full of legends. Just a few. Um, yeah, just a few. So the, the, the way they're in, we're in a big room. Uh, they've got 30 people assembled. So Mark Hudson, the producer, says, OK, first thing we're going to do is we'll have all the singers, the professional singers up front and everybody else in the back. And now at the time, you know, I'm the lead singer in Seven Horse. But at the time, I was just playing drums in Dada. So I didn't think of myself that way. So I went to the back. And we did a pass of this vocal and, and uh, we're just singing la la di da, you know, whatever the words were. And we finish up and he goes, OK, now let's mix it up. Let's switch it up. Let's get the non singers up front. And I hear Ringo go, well, no, I'm going to go up front. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> and so I go up front and I find my, and I we come around different sides and I find myself standing directly next to Ringo Starr. We're, wow. we're side by side. And he's a, and I, I'm not a big guy. I'm like five seven. Ringo's coming up to about here on me. He's a real wow. Guy. So yeah, so he's like not, Tom Cruise. Yeah, he's like Tom Cruise. Yeah. Uh, I think in the old Beatle days, he wore very high boots. Um, yeah, well, I'm standing have. there, and I realize that like this is my chance. This is my one chance in life, probably, to converse with Ringo. Yes. So, I, so I just I just laid it out there. I was like, listen, man. I love you, uh, the Beatles, blah, blah, blah. I wouldn't, I'm a drum. He goes, oh, what do you do? I said, well, I'm a drummer. Oh, another drummer, eh? yeah. And I'm just like, <laughs> I'm going off, you know? Well, first we, we sang the track down. And then then I turned to him and I, you know, that was the end of the session. And then I turned to him and I, I laid all this out for him. And I was just like, and he's like, yeah, take it easy. It's all right, you know? And uh, <laughs> he was super cool, though. So <laughs> and I was just laying it all out for him. I was like, and you do a good oh, ringo. You do a yeah, good well, I've been listening. <laughs> so I, I laid all this out, right? And then everybody brought a camera out. Everybody had a camera except us. And we're like, well, uh, uh, somebody get a picture of this. So right. I have this photo of the three of us, um, or the four of us, myself, Joey, our other bandmate, Mike, and me with my arm around Ringo. Uh, somebody was gracious enough to take this photo. Now, oh, awesome. later, I look into the control room, right? I look in the control room of the studio, and there's his wife, Barbara Bach, sitting in there, the actress, and at that time, just beautiful actress, Barbara Bach is sitting inside the control room. So I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about myself right now. So I figure, well, if I just met Ringo, I'm gonna go meet his wife. So I march <laughs> into the control room, and I say, hello, uh, but, um, you know, I introduce myself, and I say, listen, I just, I just spewed it out all over your husband. I hope he didn't, <laughs> you know, freak out or anything. And she's like, oh, no. He loves to hear from guys like you who were inspired by him. And let me tell you a secret. When Bono came to the house, he did the exact same thing. So don't feel bad. <laughs> and so, you know, that expression that people have, you know, walking on air, you, you've heard that expression before. I never really knew what that meant. But the, but my bandmates and I went out for a beer at a at a British pub after the after that uh, record session and we were just sitting around this table we could not believe what had just happened and I literally felt like my feet were not attached to the earth anymore because it was just the most incredible moment of my life after thinking about it's amazing how the universe can work for you in these ways I mean I thought about Ringo Starr and the Beatles almost every day of my life for 30 years or right. I don't know how old I was at the time 20 29 years whatever it was and there he was somehow that energy brought us together that close. 
and you know then we went our separate ways i've never seen him again in person obviously but but just to get that opportunity right. to exchange that with him was magic man it was absolute magic you see this is why we asked That's the story. you know i mean how would we how would you have known any of this this is why you have to ask and 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 i amazing story are you kidding me this is yeah. this i mean I, I couldn't imagine you know and, and that you know to feel that but maybe one day maybe one you day i don't know i mean there may be the person that you know i don't know if who that person is for you guys but if you if you, i i truly believe like if if that's in your mind enough there's some way some connection throughout the universe that brings these things together very I've true other, i've had other experiences like that you know i'm a huge uh, baseball fan and baseball player in high school and later in my uh, adult years i played some tournament baseball uh, as you know and and over 35 World Series and that kind of stuff. And nice. I've been around some I've been around some pro athletes um, at clinics and camps and, uh, you know, and just having these experiences to get this close kind of uh, contact with people that you really uh, idolize or look up to. It's it's um, it's real magical when it does happen. It doesn't happen all I'm, the time. So I always keep that in mind. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I always no. keep that in mind when I meet you know, we've we've had fans of our music for 30 years from Dada through Seven Horse. And every time I meet one of them, I, I remember how I, you know, I don't certainly put myself in the category of Ringo Starr or any of these super famous people. But I do have fans that have been listening to our music for a long time. Of course. And, and it always brings me back to that moment. It's like this is a big deal for that person. Even if for you, it's like, who am I? You know, what is it? You know, they don't really know me or whatever. But I know what's going on on the other side. I've never forgotten that. And I think it's served me pretty well in those in those moments. I, I think just in general, if people always have to realize that their fans and the people that are supporting them are the ones that matter the most. You know, Absolutely I mean, true. that's what makes people. You know, it, it, the same thing with Empire, the same thing with anything. I mean, if it wasn't for you guys listening and wanting to hear what we ask and what we talk about and where we're so thankful, it's, it's, but I guess what I was going to say is people, they're still people at the end of the day. And I think some people forget that. They're like, well, they're superstars or this, but they're still people. And, okay. and th they go through the same trials and tribulations as us. They love, and I think that they just, you know, like you were saying, or her, uh, his wife was saying, it's, He's going after Bono, saying the same thing. Like, it's yeah. just, you know, it's who's your, whoever that person is, there's always someone bigger or there's always somebody different. Well, no, or, in, in that case, you know, it was Bono did it to him. You know, Bono right. came and Oh, by the way, Bono did it to him as well, right. Yeah, that's Bono, what I was, Bono was, yeah. you know, who's like one of the biggest rock stars on the planet. Exactly. The that's what I, <laughs> he was like, Gringo, I love you. You know, <laughs> <laughs> he was fanboying out. All right. He totally fanboying it. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, again, and there was one other thing. Um, I know that we were talking about it. You were walking. It was just kind of funny because I saw it. Blue Man Group. How was that? Then you worked. You said you worked with Blue Man Group. Yeah. Uh, you know, in uh, 2000, uh, you know, if you if you want to hear a, a little bit about what it's like to have a major label record deal. Uh, the last record deal that Dada had was with MCA Records in the late 90s. And by 1999, we were dropped from the we, we made a big, uh, you know, very expensive record in 1998 with big name producer and all kinds of fanfare. And by 1999, we were dropped from the label. I was bankrupt and divorced, lost my apartment in Malibu, and my life was completely cratered from this experience of being signed to this major label. <laughs> so, I mean, I was basically working a delivery job with a shirt that like said speedy delivery delivering packages when one day I opened up the LA Weekly I mean I was really depressed too it's like I don't know what I'm going to do because I didn't really have no job skills other than playing music and being an entertainer right. so I opened the LA Weekly and there was a, a, an ad there open call for Blue Man Group and I'd kind of heard about Blue Man Group at the time <clears throat> but I didn't know that much about it and uh, <clears throat> I sent I just sent them you know I, I applied and uh, they said yeah okay you can audition and so audition for the show and the next thing I know was in New York on the call back and the next thing that I knew after that I actually got the gig in back in Las Vegas which was my hometown so in 2000 I moved back to Las Vegas from LA and uh, worked at the Luxor with Blue Man Group for the next three years and it was an incredible time there to be involved in a show just getting on its feet in Vegas with an amazing 
group of musicians from all over the country that they had, you know, and they weren't looking for like theater kind of guys. They were looking for rock and roll guys that would work in the theater. So the theater experience is, is, is really unique. You know, this sort of instant family, it's like a sports team. It's like everybody falls in love with everybody right away because you've got this common goal to put this show up. And it was, it, it hit me. It was perfect perfect time for me because I really needed someplace to call home. And these guys helped me get back on my feet. Um, and the relationships, I still have friends that are still in the show, if you can believe it, that have been there for over 20 years. I couldn't do it for that long because I had ambitions to make my own music. And I just, I couldn't, the repetition of doing the same show every day, day after day, seven times a week, whatever it was. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I got oh. burned out on it after a few years. Okay, but imagine. it was an amazing job, especially at that time. I mean, we and we had Las Vegas wired, you know, because we would get we would get off at 1230 from the late show and then we'd go out and we'd be out until, <laughs> you know, six, seven in the morning because you didn't have to be at work until five in the afternoon. So right. I, mean, I was living I was living my dad's life from 25 years ago where <laughs> you were working, you're working the night shift and you're partying all you know, at four or five in the morning and you're just trying to get back to your apartment before the sun comes up. That was my only like, I could not face the dawn. I would have to get back. I was like, oh, I got to go. It's time for me. No, and especially, I'm sure all, all that blue paint had been melted by then, so you guys were probably just <laughs> all looking at a mess, so, you know. Well, I mean, that that's an incredible job. I mean, and you know what? You got definitely some incredible stories there, Phil, so, you know, I, I, you've done some impressive things and we want to see what the hell you got going on here next. So if you wouldn't mind, tell everybody what uh, you have going and where they can follow you and find you. All right. Well, we're we're getting ready to release our fifth album, is Seven Horse. It's called The Last Resort. The album comes out on October the 28th. We're actually, I don't know when this is going to air, but our third single from the album is dropping on Friday, September the 30th. Uh, and then the full album comes out October the 28th, Seven Horse, The Last Resort. We're doing an album release show uh, here in Los Angeles in Hollywood at the Roxy Theater. It's a legendary venue in Hollywood, which we have gone out on a limb and bought out the place. Basically, we didn't, we're not working. We're promoting the show ourselves, producing it ourselves. So we rented out the Roxy for the night, nice. bringing a big, much bigger production Great. inside this 500 cap room with video and uh, a lot of other surprises to try to make this a real event for us and our fans at the Roxy, which the show's on sale now and, and it will take place on November the 4th. Uh, so oh, the birthday. album on October, is that your birthday? Yeah, it's my birthday. Perfect. We'll be celebrating. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll be celebrating. celebrating. His birthday there That's that awesome. night as well. <laughs> uh, hope you can make it. There you go. So we've got the album coming out. we got the show coming up. Everybody can reach us at our website, sevenhorsemusic.com. It's the number seven and the word horse all together, seven horse. Um, and, of course, we're on every social media platform, Facebook, uh, Instagram, TikTok, if you can believe it, nice. uh, YouTube, our videos are up on YouTube. I, I tweet, uh, we're everywhere. We're trying to reach as many people as we possibly can. So you can find us at anywhere, uh, uh, any of those platforms. We're up everywhere and at our website, sevenhorsemusic.com. Excellent, Phil. Excellent. I do appreciate all your time. And for all of our followers, go ahead and please like, subscribe, share the podcast. Tell your friends about it. Tell them to get educated. And you can find us on any of your platforms like Spotify, uh, you know, Apple, Amazon, anything where you listen to. So we do appreciate your time, Phil, and everybody else. Remember, until next time, stay out there, stay educated in the cannabis The opinions expressed on this CannabisRadio.com program are those of the guests and hosts and do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of CannabisRadio.com. Any rebroadcast, republication, or retransmission of this program without proper consent is prohibited.